to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim the news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in hosea 13 verse 11 god reminded israel I gave you a king in my anger, and I took him away in my wrath. That comment is about one of the worst kings and worst decisions that Israel had ever made to ask for a king. We welcome you today to our study of King Saul and the practical lessons that we can learn from this Old Testament study. We're so happy that you've joined us for our broadcast today. We encourage you, as always, to visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. We have a, a wide variety of Old Testament and New Testament lessons, both on audio and video, that you can uh, view from our website. Also, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any lesson, we give those to people free of charge. All you've got to do is go to our website, fill out a media request form, or you can write to us or call us or email us at the information given at the end of this broadcast. And friend, we want to encourage you today to stop by the Church of Christ in your local area. The people at the Lord's Church there would love for you to come to their assemblies to visit their worship. If you've got questions about God or the Bible or salvation, they'd be more than happy to sit down and talk to you about God and His divine Word. And friend, at the Gospel of Christ, we'd also be happy to help you in your study of the Scripture. You can write to us or call us, and we'll be glad to touch base with you on any of the matters that you may be studying about relative to the Bible. Let's now direct our attention to a very dark and dismal time in Israel's history, almost as bad as the time of the judges. This is when Israel asked for a king. We need to realize from the outset of this study that God was never happy with His people's desire to be like the other nations and ask for a king. In 1 Samuel 8, about verses 3 through 8, the people are now going to approach uh, uh, Eli. They're going to say to him, you know, give us a king. We want to be like the rest of the nations. We want a king to reign over us. And uh, he's heartbroken. Samuel is heartbroken about that because he doesn't know what to say. And so he approaches God and God says to Samuel, not Eli, but Samuel, God says to him, you know, don't take it personally. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. From the outset, realize Israel already had a king. God was on the throne. He was the greatest king you could ever have. He had not been removed, and he was ruling and reigning in Israel. And as long as they followed him, they prospered. But they began to ask God, give us a king. We want to be like everybody else. Peer pressure had taken in. And friend, in fact, when the people asked for this, God warned them that they would rue the day that they had asked for a king to be like everybody else. In fact, to their credit, in 1 Samuel 12, verse 19, the people are going to eventually realize, hey, we've sinned by asking for a king. Nevertheless, the people asked for a king, and God allowed them to have what they thought they really needed. You know, there's even a practical lesson to be learned in that. You need to be very careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. The people of Israel did not need Saul as a king. He was not a good king. He did not help them spiritually. He, in fact, further separated them from God and His will. And sometimes in our life, we ask for things that we think we need, maybe without even really thinking it through. Or when we ask for something and God doesn't maybe give that to us, sometimes we even get a little angry about it. But friend, let's realize God can see and knows what's best for us. And we need to put our trust and hope in Him and be very careful what we ask for because you might get it and it might not be that good for you. When you think about Saul, I want to give, first of all, a little historical information about this individual. 
Saul was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a uh, son of Kish, according to 1 Samuel 9, verse 1. He was from the town of Gibeah, which was a city about five miles north of Jerusalem. He was appointed king of Israel around 1090, and he reigned for about 40 years until the year 1050. Saul's death in battle was due to him being severely wounded by the enemy's archers and, of course, a botched suicide uh, attempt. The account of Saul's life can be found in 1 Samuel chapters 9 through 31 and in 1 Chronicles chapter 10. Now, let's think about Saul. There's some good that Saul did. There's some really bad things that he did, and then there's some really ugly things that we're going to think about as well. Let's talk about, first of all, the good in Saul's life. Not everything about Saul was bad. In fact, before he was appointed king, Saul had a great sense of humility in his life. Listen to 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 20 and 21. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was chosen. When he caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Matri was chosen, and Saul the son of Kish was chosen. But when they sought him, he could, they couldn't find him. He's, he's a very humble person. He's trying to live his life according to a, the will of God and not looking, as it were, for the spotlight. You know, Saul also excelled in physical qualities, in physical stature, in good looks. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 9 verse 2 that he is as it were head and shoulders above everybody else. Maybe he was a really tall, handsome, good looking man. Although not an inherent quality of good, there is something that the people saw in, uh, saw in this way. Uh, we notice also as the good that he did, the Spirit of God initially came upon Saul and it even worked in him through accomplishing his will. We find that in 1 Samuel 10 verse number 6. Saul did much good even in some of the battles he fought for God against the heathen nations. You read about these in 1 Samuel 11 and 1 Samuel 13 through 15. And so there were glimpses, albeit very short-lived, that Saul had some good things in his life. But friend, the bad and the ugly that he did is what Saul is really remembered for. What made Saul a bad king? Here's the bad that he did. Saul's first transgression that really stood out in God's mind and that was very visible to the people is that Saul participated in unauthorized worship to God. He officiated in and he offered sacrifices to God contrary to the Lord's word, and he is eventually punished for doing that. As a result, the dynasty of Saul is going to die that day. Listen to 1 Samuel 13, and the event being they're waiting on Samuel to come. Saul gets impatient, and in 1 Samuel 13, beginning in verse 9, here's what happened. So Saul said, bring a burnt offering and peace offerings here to me. And he offered the burnt offering. Now it happened, as soon as he had finished presenting the burnt offering, that Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. And Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines gathered together at Michmash, then I said, the Philistines will now come down on me at Gilgal. I have not made supplication to the Lord. Therefore I felt compelled and offered a burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which He commanded you. For now the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought for Himself a man after His own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be commander over His people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Saul really messed up here in the sight of God. He wasn't authorized to offer that sacrifice. Samuel, the Levites, and the others were all for, all authorized to do that. He began to listen to what he wanted. You hear the word I over and over again. He begins to think about how the people are going to view him. He begins to think about how his enemies will view him. He gets impatient 
and he offers unauthorized sacrifice and worship to God. Only Samuel was commanded to do that by God. And as a result, Saul is going to lose his dynasty when God had a plan to leave him in there. Friend, as you think about this principle and this truth here, let's realize that God means what He says when He sets laws in place. When God tells us how to worship Him, just as He told Saul how to worship, to wait on Samuel, to let him offer that sacrifice, when God tells us what He wants, friend, God means what He says. When God tells us that we're to uh, worship Him in a certain way, on the first day of the week, we're to take the Lord's Supper. Acts 20, verse 7, we're to sing and make melody in our heart. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Ephesians 5, verse 19, we're to pray to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. John chapter 14, Matthew chapter 6. Remember, God tells us how we're to do those things. God doesn't want us to alter or change or, or listen to what may be popular in the world today. God just wants us to do what He says. And so Saul's first and major blunder was that he did not respect the authority of God on worship. Then there's the second transgression of Saul, and this was a big blunder as well. Saul's second sin is that he was disobedient and rebellious to the will of God concerning the Amalekites. 1 Samuel 15, God told Saul to completely go in and annihilate all the inhabitants and all the belongings of Amalek. Now Saul did about 95% of everything God commanded him. Yet God still considered his disobedience rebellion. You see, Saul wanted to leave the best of the flocks, the best of the gifts, the best of the offerings, and his intent was, we're going to save the best and we're going to give it to God. Hadn't even the right heart and maybe the right motive. But he didn't do all that God commanded him. How did God feel about that? Listen to 1 Samuel chapter 15. Saul's disobedience and rebellion, although his motive may have been good, God considered that something that should not have been done. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed or listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He also has rejected you from being king. Friend, this was a very serious matter. God told him exactly what to do. Don't leave anything. Wipe it all out from the people down. Don't save anything. Saul's heart is, well, we'll give the best to God. We're going to do this in honor and worship and uh, give God the glory. God said, that's like you disobeying me even with the right motive. was like witchcraft and idolatry. It was disobedience, it was iniquity, and it was transgression. Friend, let's listen very carefully to the point here. God doesn't need my help, even if my motives are right. God doesn't need my help. He doesn't want me to change things. He doesn't want me to spruce it up, even if I'm doing that, to honor and glorify Him. Saul learned the hard way. When God tells you to do something, do all of it. 95, 97, 99 percent of what God asks for. It's not what God wants. God wants us to give our whole heart and our whole life to Him. He wants us to obey Him in everything that He says, and He does. And friends, Saul lost the kingdom because of this. We also know about Saul, as part of the bad that he did, that he was a very jealous person uh, over David. You read 1 Samuel 18 and 19, and the uh, spirit of jealousy begins to overtake Saul. On multiple occasions, he even tries to kill or destroy David's uh, rep reputation and who he is. Jealousy ruled his heart. It was one of the bad things that you find in Saul's life. It was a big part of his psychological downfall. Friend, don't let jealousy, anger, or revenge rule your life. God wants us to put our trust and hope in Him. Although things may not be perfect in every situation and with every person, friend, if my life and my heart is right with God, then God will take care of the rest on that final day. Now as we think about King Saul, let's also think about the ugly that he did in his life. One of the ugliest acts 
in the life of Saul was his murder of the priest of God by the hand of Doeg the Edomite. 1 Samuel 22 verses 6 through 23. Here we have Doeg, this Edomite, who doesn't care anything, anything about God or his people. And you've got the priest who's already told Saul. He's not right with God. He doesn't need to be doing these things. Won't permit him to do what Saul wants to do. And so Saul sends in this Edomite to kill the priest of God. This act was done out of envy and jealousy. And it clearly expressed the depth Saul was willing to sink into to keep his power. God's already told him, David's going to be next. Your dynasty's out. You're not following me. That's the way it's going to be. Because the messenger of God wouldn't let him have power and be the king that he wanted to be, he thought he would take out the messenger. How evil that was of Saul to try to rule against God and to do things contrary to the will of Almighty God. Friend, as we think about Saul's life and as we think about practical lessons. I need to realize that jealousy, anger, and revenge, those are not things that God wants me to do in this life. I want you to think about a passage in Romans chapter 12 which teaches us that you can't let anger and vengeance and, and these type of things rule your life. Listen to Romans 12 verse 17 following. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. In so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Saul let jealousy and vengeance and a desire for power rule his life to the point that he even has a priest of God murdered by a heathen man. He's in, he's in cords with a heathen now. This is the depths Paul, Saul sank to to keep power. Friend, we need to realize that all power ultimately belongs to God. Each of us needs to realize that we're just servants in God's house. We're servants in the kingdom of God. Uh, Mark 10 verse 45, Jesus taught us clearly that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to be a, uh, to be served, but to be a servant and to give His life a, a ransom for many. When you think about Christ, He's the ultimate servant and He gives us the example of how we ought to live. And so let's let God use us and not... There's so many people in this world who are hungry for power and anything that gets in the way, they just seem to knock them down as it were. That's the mentality of Saul. And friend, it didn't work out good for Saul at all. And it won't work out for people today. Rather than to make it my life's aim to grab hold of power and never let it go. Friend, I want to hold on to God. I want to let God be in control. Let Him have the power. And let God use me as He will. Now, another very ugly incident in the life of Saul concern, concerns the witch of Endor. Saul is now upset again because he's going to be removed as king. And so what he does is he goes to a witch or a necromancer, the witch of Endor, to seek Samuel's advice. This act is extremely deplorable because it was a clear violation of Scripture and what Saul himself had previously stood for. The Old Testament prohibited someone consulting the dead. In Deuteronomy 18, Verses 10 and 11, they weren't to consult the dead. They weren't to use witches or necromancers to do that. And Saul, in fact, Saul had banished all the mediums and all the soothsayers from the land. We learn that in 1 Samuel 28, verse 3. And yet, as an act of desperation, Saul communicates with the Lord and with Samuel by the witch of Endor. We can know that the witch was just simply a, a, a hoaxer because her response when she actually sees Samuel, 1 Samuel 28 verse 12, she, she allows Saul to do this. Now God's going to allow it to happen, but when she actually sees Samuel, she's shocked that it happened as it were. And yet Saul uses a medium, something he himself had been opposed to all his life. The extent he went, the methods he used, 
how low he stooped to keep his power is another part of his problems. Friend, again we learn that let's use the medium in the way that God has told us today, the Bible. The Bible is God's Word. The Bible is God's revelation. Prayer is how we communicate with God. God communicates with us through the Bible. Uh, astrologers, soothsayers, mediums, uh, fortune tellers, spiritists. Friend, that's not something that God has authorized today. Those are people, uh, palm readers, tarot card readers, those are people who are looking to take advantage of others. God is the true source of all knowledge, all wisdom, and God holds the future in His hand. And if we put our trust and our hope in God uh, and His Word, that's where real communication from the Almighty comes from. Too many people are looking to, to find some revelation from some other source or find some message that will bring them hope and joy and happiness. Friend, that message is found in the Bible. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. Hope is found in in Christ. Grace is found in Christ. We find God's love and mercy in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so rather than looking for another avenue to communicate with God or receive blessing from Him, put our hope and trust in God's Word, His revelation to man today. And finally, as we look at Saul's life, the last disgraceful and ugly act that he committed was Saul's own attempt to take his life or to be euthanized by another man in 1 Samuel 31 and in 2 Samuel 1. He's still trying to hold on to that power. And yet he goes into battle against the will of God. He is uh, terminally injured by an archer there. Uh, he tries to take his own life. He eventually has somebody take his life for him. But again, look at the depths he's going to to try to keep that power, to try to do uh, what he thinks God wants him to do, although God's already told him that's not right. Friend, the only way to have real happiness and joy and the only really way to access the power of God today is found in Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Philippians 4 verse 13, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As you think about the practical import of today's lesson and what we can learn from the life of Saul, we go back to the beginning where we noted that we need to be very careful what we do ask for. Israel asked for a king, and God said later, I gave you a king in my wrath. I've taken him away in my anger. Saul did not help the people of God. They already had a king. God was on the throne, but they kept insisting, we need this so we can be like everybody else. Friend, we learn from this that we need to be content with God as King. We need to be content letting God rule over our lives. And as you think about Saul, friend, realize that God wants us, just as He wanted Saul, God wants us simply to obey Him. When God tells us how to worship, that's exactly what God wants us to do. When God tells us that He wants us to obey Him, Let's realize God wants what He says. Uh, listen to these verses. In Luke 6, 46, Jesus questioned the Jewish leaders there when He said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? Jesus said, If you're going to call me Lord, the natural conclusion is, If I'm your Lord, you'll do what I tell you. And yet you're not. Matthew 7, verse 21, Jesus said, it's not everybody that looks up into heaven and says, Lord, Lord, that's going there. Well, who is? He that doth the will of the Father in heaven. Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9. Jesus is the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. Saul didn't obey God. He reaped bad, bad consequences, and so did Israel because of that. Friend, let's learn from Saul that we need to obey God. And so we ask you to consider today in your life, as we look at our lives, let's consider, are we really obeying the will of God? Initially, have you obeyed the gospel of Christ by becoming a Christian? Friend, the good news is Jesus came to save men from sin. Matthew 1, verse 19 through 21. There is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Acts 4, verse 11 and 12. And that's salvation. That gift of salvation 
can be yours today if you obey the gospel. Do you believe Jesus is the Savior of the world? In John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll surely die in your sins. Do you believe it enough to change your life and repent? The Lord said in Luke 13, verse 3, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Would you turn from sin and a life of sin and turn to God? Would you make the great confession? Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33, Jesus said that only those who confess Him would be saved. Jesus said, If you won't confess Me before men, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess Me before men, I'll also confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And friend, would you be immersed in water to have every sin washed away? In Acts chapter 9, verse 6, Saul was told, You go into the city, it'll be told you what you must do. Saul of Tarsus, you go in the city, it'll be told you what you must do. Ananias recounts that event in Acts twenty-two sixteen. As he approaches Saul of Tarsus, he says, Saul, Saul, why are you waiting? Arise! and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Would you be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins? Acts 2 verse 38. And friend, as a Christian, what we learn from the life of Saul is we need to stay true to God. We need to continue to let His power rule in our own life. Don't try to grab power for yourself. Don't be power hungry. Don't try to make a name for yourself or, or be prideful and have others look at what you do. Rather, stay humble. Let God work through you, with you, and, and stay true to the teaching of Almighty God. And then we can have the hope and joy that every Christian ought to have. Saul's life started out good. It got really bad, and then it got really ugly. And all of it was because Saul quit keeping his life humble, quit trusting God, and lived in rebellion to Him. May God help each of us to live our lives in such a way that we bring glory and honor to God and that the gospel of Christ rules our lives and we give God the glory each and every day. May God help us to do just that. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905. Or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.